in the case of Bitcoin, you know, when Satoshi came up with an idea for doing money differently, mm -hmm. he didn't write a policy paper and submit it to the IMF or go and protest outside the Federal mm -hmm. Reserve until Ben Bernanke incorporated proof of work into mm -hmm. the US dollar. Mm -hmm. Instead, he created a new system that existed in parallel alongside the old and asked people to voluntarily opt into it. Mm -hmm. We're basically doing exactly the same thing, but in the realm of governance. Hey everybody, welcome to the What Is Money Show. I am thrilled to have you here joining me on my mission to help shine light on the corruption of money. Now, if this is your first time listening to the What Is Money Show, I strongly recommend that you go back to episodes one through nine first which lays a lot of the groundwork for many of the concepts that we explore on the show. These first nine episodes are my series with Michael Saylor, and thousands of people have told me that this is the best podcast series they've ever heard, hands down, and that it was instrumental to their understanding of money and Bitcoin. So if you're looking to start a deep dive into the nature of money, I don't think there's any place better that you can start other than episode one of this show. Now, a little bit about this show and how it makes money. The What Is Money show is 100% sponsor based. So all of our revenues are derived from direct sponsorships. And I strive to be very selective about the sponsors that I work with, specifically only using sponsors that I use personally, and also choosing sponsors that have values which are well aligned to the values expressed on this show, such as freedom, education, self-sovereignty, etc. So what I'm going to do now is a few ad reads right at the top of the show, and then I'll do a few more ad reads in the middle. And I hope you'll take the time to listen to them, as again, these are hand-selected sponsors, and I think you'll like what they have to offer. Today's podcast is brought to you by N. Wolf's Clothing. Wolf is the first startup accelerator dedicated exclusively to the Bitcoin Lightning Network. Four times per year, Wolf brings teams from around the world to New York City to work with like-minded entrepreneurs, pushing the boundaries of what's possible with Bitcoin and Lightning. The program is designed to help early stage companies achieve product market fit, develop their brand, secure early stage funding, and grow businesses that help fuel the global adoption of Bitcoin. So go to wolfnyc.com to learn more about the program or apply. Again, that's WolfNYC, W-O-L-F-N-Y-C dot com. Peter Young, welcome to the What Is Money Show. Thanks, Robert. Good to be here. It's great to have you. We are sitting in Prague, uh, actually during Bitcoin Prague, um, which is, I guess, the biggest Bitcoin conference in Europe. Right. And uh, pretty exciting time to be here, hanging out with a lot of European Bitcoiners and Bitcoiners from all over the world. Uh just by quick wave introduction, you are the managing director of the Free Cities Foundation, which is a nonprofit focused on building cities based on free market principles. Um, pretty cool stuff. We need, we could use some more of those, I think, in the world. Um, could we start with, because you've never been on the show before, I think it'd be useful just to go through a bit of your professional background and then your pathway into Bitcoin and then into uh, the Free Cities Foundation. Sure, yeah. So I started out my career living in China. I worked for the British Embassy doing trade and investment work. So I was involved in international trade, getting Brit British companies to sell things into China. Mm -hmm. And when I was working over there, I became aware that there was a lot of Bitcoin activity going on. Mm -hmm. I wasn't really sure what this was and wasn't particularly interested. But in about 2017, I started to pay more attention and fell in with a bitcoin a crowd and i just started kind of going down the rabbit hole as one does with this as uh, studying the austrian school of economics and bitcoin at the same time mm. and that really transformed my view on what good governance is and what good economics is uh, previously um i had quite a mainstream view about how you um, conduct economic policy and then after a while i started to look at more alternative approaches mm -hmm. and that's how i came on came to find the free cities foundation they're an organization that's putting what i would describe as you know sound economic principles into practice in the real world mm -hmm. so after that realization i i came and i joined them very cool mm -hmm. well, so is this 
is this like a lo- is there a longer tradition behind this these ideas of having free cities like where where does this idea come from and what is the difference between a city that we have in the world today versus a, a city based on free market principles yeah so there's definitely a long tradition of there being independent city states mm-hmm. you can look to the uh, ancient Greek uh, city states or the Hanseatic League of uh, city states in northern Europe mm-hmm. a freely trading uh, set of uh, set of cities there uh, or the Italian city states that were very successful and well, some of the early innovators in mm-hmm. uh, money and modern banking so there's definitely a long tradition of there being successful small territories and what we're seeking to do is uh, kind of create a renaissance of of these cities uh, for the modern world, mm. using a model that allows for autonomy within existing uh, nation states. Mm. And what, so, like, what would the different, if I could just project someone into that lives in maybe a large city today, what the differences would be in their day to day life from where they are today to where, what it would be like to live in a free private city? Like, what would be the most salient features that were different from one city to the other? Yeah. Okay, so there's two definitions just to just to clarify at the beginning. So there's something called a free city, which is really quite a broad definition. That's defined as any self-governing territory that has a special focus on upholding individual rights and freedoms. Mm-hmm. And what we do as a foundation is we say that we look at the world and we think that there aren't really that many varieties of governance model available. Mm-hmm. So most countries will uh, raise taxes via a very complicated system that most people regard as being a bit unfair. Mm. Most countries will have their own inflationary currency. Um, There's often quite a lot of services that are administered centrally rather than administered by the market. And this tends to be common to most uh, nation states. Mm -hmm. And we basically argue that there should be more innovation in governance. And Mm. the way to create that is to encourage the development of more autonomous jurisdictions. Mm. And we call those autonomous jurisdictions free cities. Mm -hmm. They can come in all different shapes and sizes. They could have a very free market model or they might be more um you know communitarian and centrally administered if they Mm -hmm. want our primary goal is just to create more so that people can choose and those that succeed um Mm -hmm. will will flourish but aside from that we have our own preferences about which models we think are actually going to work best on Mm -hmm. an entrepreneurial basis and those uh, would include the the free private cities model Mm -hmm. and that kind of model is starting to be developed today there's already a couple of projects that i and come on to a bit later that are implementing something pretty similar um, and life in those would look uh, pretty different to um, a modern city mm. so for example in an in a normal city you have a government that basically decides what the rules of conduct are for mm-hmm. the entire population mm-hmm. the idea is that that government is elected and a new government typically is in place every you know five to ten years sometimes less than that and the rules that the government decides on are uh, the population just has to accept them. Whereas in this free private city model, rather than there being changeable rules, there is a fixed citizen's contract, which functions like a service agreement in the commercial world. Mm -hmm. So the operator of the city would guarantee you um, the protection of life, liberty, and property. But other than that, basically allow you to interact with everyone else on a voluntary basis Mm. and they would say that the the fees that they would charge for that are fixed a bit like if you're renting an apartment Mm -hmm. you know you you're guaranteed that there'll be some kind of service maybe the common areas are maintained Mm -hmm. maybe the gardens are maintained but uh, there will be a fixed price for the amount of uh, land that you're able to Mm -hmm. occupy and free private cities operate in the same way you'll basically pay a fixed service fee you're guaranteed some basic protections like your security uh, protection of life, liberty, and property. Mm. But other than that, you're pretty much free to to do what you want mm. as long as it doesn't harm other people. Sounds pretty intuitive. Like what c- cities should be that way, right? How did we how did we go from I, I assume I assume cities were like that at some point? Maybe not though. But it sounds like the ideal city, right? You're just preserving life, liberty, and property for a fixed fee. Yeah. And then everything else is consensually it's it's a free market right people are consensually trading and doing whatever else they want yeah um how did we deviate from that ideal city to what we have today like what where did we go wrong i guess so i'd say that this 
model, this free private city model does draw on some historical elements. Mm -hmm. Like there have been cities in the past that have had pretty lean governance models and they haven't intervened too heavily mm -hmm. in the lives of their citizens. They haven't seeked to provide like the comprehensive services that we associate with like modern Western welfare states, mm -hmm. for example. But the actual idea of having a fixed fee so that every member of the city pays a certain amount that's specified in a contract, that's new for cities. Oh, okay. You know, it exists in commercial yeah. uh, commercial arrangements. If you rent an apartment yeah. or if you're part of, say, a shopping mall, there'll typically be a mm -hmm. rental agreement and then rules about how you can conduct yourself in the public areas mm -hmm. of the shopping mall. But um, we're basically taking that idea and applying it to to cities. Yeah. So that would be the the, the innovation. Um, and so it's not really been done before in exactly this way, but we think that there's historical precedent that shows that similar things work pretty well. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. And then I imagine there's a lot of people that are interested in this idea, right? Uh, I, I think every Bitcoiner and or libertarian minded person would probably want to live in a city like this. Mm. Um, you guys, you're a nonprofit, so you're a donor-based organization. That's correct. Yeah. Where are you on actually developing cities like this? Like, mm. uh, is this a matter of approaching an existing city and then pitching a, a new model and then bringing in funding and citizens? Or like, how how do you actually implement this idea into the real world? Mm. So what we do is we really advocate for the idea of free cities. Mm -hmm. And there have been some successful examples of uh, projects that have been able to get legal autonomy that mm -hmm. are starting to put ideas pretty similar to that free private cities model, not entirely the same, but mm -hmm. pretty similar uh, into practice already. So the two most prominent examples of those are the Honduran ZAs. So in 2013, a new law was established in Honduras that allowed for the development of special zones that were able to conduct, basically act like independent entities in the areas, in, in the realm of commercial law. Uh -huh. So criminal law still applies in these zones. Honduran criminal law still applies. Mm -hmm. Honduran constitution still applies. But otherwise, these zones can um, be regulated by the regulations of foreign countries, or they can have no standard commercial law apply. The tax arrangements are also much lighter. There is some kind of uh, requirement that there is a there is some some common mm -hmm. taxes like an income tax, but this is kept pretty low, and other taxes are are, are very low as well. Mm -hmm. So this was introduced in in 2013, and since then there are two major projects that have been able to garner investment and put that into practice. Mm -hmm. uh, those are Prospera, which is a a development on the tropical island of Roatan. Mm. Um, and they also there's also a site in the Saber on the northern coast of Honduras. And then there's another project called Ciudad Morazan, which is an inland development. Both very different developments, um, but both of them have, at this stage, around, um, I think Ciudad Morazan has probably got around 50 residents right now. Uh, Prospera has got 100 people that are sort of living and working there on a daily basis. Mm around 160 resident businesses. So these are probably the most advanced examples of something approaching free cities that, that we have today. But beyond that, we actually have a directory. It consists of 13 projects mm -hmm. and they range from legally autonomous zones like Prosper and Ciudad Morazan through to you know less autonomous zones that are really just kind of communities of like-minded people hmm. that have some more distant aspiration to have independence. Gotcha. And what are what are we seeing in those cities so far? I guess, first of all, how many years old are they? How long have these projects been active? And hmm. how successful have they been in realizing these ideals? Yeah, so uh, Prospera was established in 2017. That was the first of the Honduran Zenes. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ciudad Morazan was established the year after. Mm -hmm. uh, so far, they've been, I mean, Prospera, in terms of investment, they've managed to garner about 60 million US dollars of investment. So it's not astronomical figures mm -hmm. in the grand scheme of what you need to develop mm -hmm. um, you know, urbanism on a large scale. Sure. But it's also not insignificant. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of what companies they've been able to attract, I made my first visit to Prospera in uh, 2021. And it was a pretty a pretty early stage. You know, it was great to see there were some buildings, there were people working there. Mm -hmm. But when I went back again in in 22, um, things had really picked up. You know, mm -hmm. there was it was hard to find any space within the current buildings uh, because there were so many business people trying to work there. 
they also had a 12 story set of really nice apartment blocks that were almost finished mm-hmm. they're going to be finished in september so things are really pushing ahead and um there's actually a, a, a stand by a company called Amity Age, mm-hmm. which is a Bitcoin education center. Mm-hmm. And that's smack bang in the middle of, of Prospera. So that wasn't there when I first made yeah. the visit. Um, so I would say in terms of you know what you'd expect from an urban development, things are progressing pretty quickly. And I'm pretty encouraged by what they've been able to do. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, The Gold Investment Letter. The Gold Investment Letter helps sophisticated investors navigate capital markets and maximize their profits in trading gold, silver, and mining stocks. The Gold Investment Letter seeks out the most undervalued companies and identifies special situations in the mining sector, and then provides in-depth analysis on both their financial positions and future prospects. The Gold Investment Letter explores many complex domains, such as investor psychology, portfolio management, and macroeconomic trends, all with the goal of making you a better investor. The Gold Investment Letter offers a free version and a paid premium version, and I strongly recommend you at least sign up for the free version because after having read a few of these issues, I can promise you it is a treasure trove of good information. You can sign up for the free newsletter today at goldinvestmentletter.com. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, iCoin Technology. iCoin has just released a sleek new hardware wallet. It looks like a mini iPhone, a little touch screen and camera on it. Uh, the device has no Wi-Fi, no cellular connection, no GPS. It's a strictly physically cold hardware wallet. Uh, like I said, it's got a high-res 3-inch touch screen. It's got a camera for air gapping the wallet. Uh, it's got optional Bluetooth compatibility. And it's a really a, a brand new UI, UX experience for a hardware wallet, making it very accessible, easy to use, not intimidating. And as we always talk about on this show, the only way you can truly own your Bitcoin is by having it in self-custody. So you need a device like iCoin Wallet to truly own your Bitcoin. Go to iCoinTechnology.com today and use promo code BITCOIN23 for 30% off of this new sleek hardware wallet. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, CrowdHealth. CrowdHealth is a Bitcoin-enabled alternative to legacy health insurance. Now let's face it, legacy health insurance is an absolute scam. Nobody can explain this better than the legendary comedian, Chris Rock. Insurance, you got to have some insurance. You got to, there's an insurance. They shouldn't even call it insurance. They should just call it in case shit. And I give a company some money in case shit happen. Now, if shit don't happen, shouldn't I get my money back? <laughs> so with CrowdHealth, instead of just paying premiums that you'll never see again, you can hold part of this pool of savings in dollars and in Bitcoin through CrowdHealth. And when you have a health event, you can draw against this pool of communal savings. So go to joincrowdhealth.com slash breedlove to learn more or sign up. It's interesting. And so you mentioned, well, let's focus on Prospera. Yeah. It's in Honduras. It's so, in Honduras, yeah. So they have, they're subject to Honduran constitutional law, but they have different economic law. Is that what? That's correct. Okay. Yes. Um, what is, is it a, their own independent economic law? Or are they inheriting it from another country or how does, how does that work? Yeah, it's a good question. So they have a a quite unique position. If a company wants to set up um, a business within Prospera, they can decide either that they're not going to be regulated at all, Mm -hmm. or if they feel that they want to be regulated because of perceptions of their Mm -hmm. product overseas. So Mm -hmm. if they're imported, if they're exporting, say, cars to Germany, they might want to be able to say, we are compliant with all of German automotive regulations, right. then they can choose to have German automotive regulations um, that determine what kinds of activity they can they conduct. So they mm. can be bound by those regulations, even though those are the regulations of another country. Mm-hmm. So within Prospera, you can have any OECD country's regulations apply to you, and all of your contracts can stay. You know, this contract, in this contract, Swedish law uh, applies. Mm. So if there is a dispute, this will go to a Swedish judge, or German law or US law, you can choose like any OECD regulation. Or you can say, in the case of disputes, we're just going to be bound by common law principles. Mm -hmm. And that typically 
um, seem might seem simpler, but it can be a bit more costly because sometimes there are greater liabilities if you mm. don't have a regulation that you are seen to have followed, yeah. and you're just operating on purely um, common law common law principles. Yeah. So it's quite a unique regulatory position where you can choose either to be regulated or uh, to just have common law. And, and on a contract by contract basis, it sounded like. On a contract by contract basis. Wow. Yeah. So that could maybe even get pretty complex, I would imagine, if you're doing business in a lot of different countries and choosing to be regulated under a lot of different frameworks. You could do. You, yeah. It could get complex, yeah. and uh, that's one of the things that the business will have to will have to bear in mind to decide. Yeah, um, that they'll they'll still be bound legally. Yeah. So, and they'll have to make sure that they're complying with the correct regulations if that's what we right. choose. But Prosper has an arbitration center that will will deal with these, oh, and okay. that's one of the kind of functions of the of the uh, governing entity that it will help to manage that in exchange for fees from the companies right and this becomes a, just a point of negotiation in each contract then right deciding what regulatory framework applies and what court would try it if it needed to be tried stuff like that yes that's correct yeah. those companies would be deciding that on a and then how so basis. like today if i want to move to prospera and become a working free citizen in their free city like what does that process look like are they only are they only taking in companies or they're actually opening this up to private citizens that want to, say, join the city? So you can become a e-resident of Prospera for uh, $1,200 US dollars per year mm. if you're a non-Honduran citizen. Mm -hmm. If you're Honduran, they lower that to $300. Uh, okay. So it's, it's kind of quite an affordable process. Um, you can apply. There's some basic kind of KYC, I guess you could call it, mm -hmm. that they do on they do on you before they accept your application or not. But um, it's pretty pretty light touch. And then once you have that, you can uh, you can access things like banks in Prospera. You can set up a bank account at Seychelles Bank, which is a mm -hmm. newly established uh, bank that they have within the jurisdiction. Uh, you can be part of the Prospera community. You can um, live in one of the apartments in 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 Prospera. They've got about. 80 units that are due to be finished in in September mm -hmm. and you can you know set up a, a business and uh, access all of access all of the services that are available to the, to hmm. the citizens and is it that's not a Honduran citizenship or passport though right it's separate from that right exactly yeah. so because these are not sovereign states yeah. they are autonomous or semi-autonomous territories within Honduras you still have to comply with Honduran immigration law. Okay. Which typically isn't too stringent, but you need to be able to get a Honduran visa or work permit yeah. in order to be in in Honduras and in Prospera, gotcha. in Ciudad Morazán. Yeah. Both of these, this applies yeah. to both of the, the developments. So as long as you can meet the, the normal requirements, which aren't too stringent, then you can come and, and move and be part of these zones. Gotcha. And how, what is the population of these places? And is it, is it, growing are they look uh, is there a cap they're trying to get to or is it just fill it with as many people as possible like what what is what does that look like so right now there are about 50 people that are actually living in Ciudad Morazan mm -hmm. the inland development and that's kind of lim that's limited by the number of houses there are. i think mm -hmm. there are 64 housing units currently mm -hmm. under con under construction and uh, there are plans to develop more but one of the things that the development the Ciudad Morazan is waiting on is for more political clarity. So mm. um, there have been some political challenges in Honduras mm. related to these to these zones. Um, the current government is really opposed to the zones. Mm -hmm. uh, these were actually established under the previous government. And one of the things that tends to happen when you have uh, general elections is that new parties that come in oppose the policies of the previous party, mm -hmm. especially if the new parties come in are uh, very socialist parties, mm -hmm. which is what's happened in the case of Honduras. Yeah. So one of the things that we did and our, our founder did really was work with these zones to establish a really strong legal basis so that when the government changed, there wouldn't be lots of changes in the political structure mm -hmm. within, the, within the zones. And so far, that's proved to be quite resilient. Mm. The current government are trying to disrupt what's happening in the zones, mm. and they have. Oh, they are. They are. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. because they're they're opposed to they're opposed to this idea, but they haven't been able to do that too much. Um, but what I should say is that right now, coming back to your question about 
occupancy and population. Yeah. Ciudad Morazan is kind of limited by the number of units. Prosper is really just pushing on, actually. Mm. They, they've continued to build at a very fast pace. Mm. Um, they're pursuing slightly different strategies. But, you know, we'll see when we come to the next general election who is who is elected. Um, mm. The current government approval rating isn't great at the mm-hmm. moment. So if we do get a change of government again, there's a good chance that we'll have a new boost. And then uh, we could see, you know, many more people. You know, the aspiration is for, for thousands of people to be living in these zones rather than the current state where it's dozens. Dozens. Okay, gotcha. Um, okay, what... And so again, these are cities based on free market principles, so there's a lot less top-down... There's just a lot more options, I guess, for citizens, for companies. Lower taxation overall, it sounds That's like. It. Yeah. Um, so th- presumably these territories or these cities would draw in a lot of direct foreign direct investment because you could be more productive with your capital there. That's it. Um, in what ways is this related to Bitcoin? I mean, it, it sounds like perhaps it has the ethos of Bitcoin and that it's more of a decentralized free market approach um, to, I guess, city governance in this case, whereas B- Bitcoin is that for money. How are the, the ethos of these two movements, how do they overlap? Yeah. So there are a couple of aspects to my answer to that question. The first one is that Bitcoiners generally Uh tend to value freedom and decentralization. Uh So Bitcoin is an attempt to decentralize our money by Uh taking it out of the power of a centralized authority like a bank Uh or a government. And free cities are an attempt to do that in the realm of conventional politics. Uh They're a move against having large centralized states towards having smaller states that peacefully cooperate and trade. Mm-hmm. So there's that focus on decentralization. Mm-hmm. There's also something else that I think is quite an important parallel, and it's the approach that the free cities movement takes and how that compares to the approach that Bitcoins take. And that's the approach of not trying to change the existing reality from within, but building something parallel that can serve as a better alternative and allowing people to voluntarily opt in. Mm. So in the case of Bitcoin, you know, when Satoshi came up with an idea for doing money differently, Mm -hmm. he didn't write a policy paper and submit it to the IMF or go and protest outside the Federal Mm -hmm. Reserve until Ben Bernanke incorporated proof of work into Mm -hmm. the US dollar. Mm -hmm. Instead, he created a new system that existed in parallel alongside the old and asked people to voluntarily opt into it. Mm -hmm. We're basically doing exactly the same thing but in the realm of governance. So we're not going and protesting outside central government offices or writing to our MP Mm -hmm. or campaigning and saying, we know what the right answer is for hundreds of millions of other people. Mm -hmm. Please impose our system on them. Mm -hmm. Instead, we're taking greenfield land and we're taking uh, capital from from investors that believe in the project and we're putting that into creating infrastructure Mm -hmm. and not imposing an idea on any population that doesn't doesn't want it. Mm-hmm. And so it's this idea of creating new systems and allowing people to voluntarily opt in, which is a very free market and yeah. voluntarist idea, uh, that I think Bitcoin and free cities both have in common. And would these cities be making use of Bitcoin at any point? I mean, I assume you're like in the case of the Honduras city, like they probably still have to use Honduran currency. Mm. in those cities I'm not sure how, how does that work actually what is the monetary you mentioned they have their own economic law but what about the actual monetary authority inside of these cities yeah so there's no requirement within these cities to use any particular currency interesting um, so you could pay your the fees that are due to prosper they can be paid in US dollars they can be paid in Bitcoin they can be paid in Honduran Limperas um, prosper like to point out that they were actually the first territory a few months before El Salvador to make Bitcoin equivalent to legal tender. Mm. So the reason I say equivalent is because in El Salvador, technically, you're supposed to accept Bitcoin if mm-hmm. you are a merchant. You know, that's, mm-hmm. that's the rule. It's, uh, it's supposed to be a legally accepted mm-hmm. uh, method of payment. And uh, uh, what Prospera wanted to do was slightly different. They didn't want to impose any kind of currency on people. Right. So they selected um, some, some currencies and said, these are all equivalent to legal tender. You can pay any fees to us in those. 
Um, in reality, yeah, people are using uh, US dollars because there's a lot of international trade going in and out of these places. You've got US companies that are kind of offshored and mm -hmm. have uh, have offices that are within within Prospera. Um, and then you've got some people using Bitcoin, like for example, some of the apartments that have been uh, constructed at the moment have been mm -hmm. purchased using using Bitcoin. So there's already uh, incorporation of Bitcoin into some of the developments. Within our free communities directory, I'd say probably about half have Bitcoin used in some way. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, it's it's. I think I see a lot more potential for Bitcoin to go further mm -hmm. in the future. You know, like Amity Age, the, the education company, for example. When I last visited Prospera, uh, they told me that their Bitcoin education center is already onboarded about 30 local businesses to accept right. Bitcoin payments. So I think there's more of that kind of activity to come as well. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, are you seeing a lot of interest from Bitcoiners? I mean, it sounds like this could be a template for constructing the infamous citadels that Bitcoiners always talk about. Right. Um, are, are you seeing that interest? And if so, like, where where might that be headed? Yeah, so we, we really have seen quite a lot of interest from Bitcoiners. And it's great because I actually came, discovered Bitcoin before I discovered free cities. Mm -hmm. So I sort of think of myself as at least chronologically like a Bitcoiner. Um, <laughs> but, mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it's because the principles resonate quite a lot. Um, you know, we hold a conference every year uh, in, in Prague. And last year we had a whole array of Bitcoiners come along. I know you just finished interviewing Nuts Van Holm, mm -hmm. like him and some, some other colleagues were there. Stefan Levera was there. Um, we've got like lots of people that are like kind of big into the Bitcoin scene, but also supporters. So I, I really see like these two like mutually supportive um, these are two very mutually supportive fields. Uh, what's in it for like the Honduran government? Like why, I keep drawing on Honduras just as like a live example, but yeah. what's in it for any government to want to have one of these free autonomous zones inside of an existing nation state? Yeah. So it's a reasonably hard sell for a government mm -hmm. because governments by their nature don't like to give up power. So you have to come up with some kind of proposal to a government mm -hmm. that is genuinely win-win. And that's what we like to think that we're doing. The g deal is generally, we will bring in high quality jobs, investment, infrastructure, talented people in exchange for being granted this autonomy for mm -hmm. uh, 50 to 100 years. And the government will receive typically some sort of percentage of the revenues that mm -hmm. are generated by the zone. Mm -hmm. So this is a way in which the government, if they're going to be forgoing tax, they can make some of that back or make even more of that back. It obviously depends on how successful the zone is. Mm -hmm. So if you have a, an area of land that is currently not utilized and you can turn that into something that's going to generate some revenue for a government, mm -hmm. then that's on the plus side of the balance mm -hmm. sheet for yeah. the government. Yeah. So that's essentially what, what you have. In, in um, the two zones I mentioned, the, the deal is that they operate like commercial companies, but then 12% of the revenues is then redirected to the central government. Mm. And that, in theory, is supposed to cover things like, you know, national defense and foreign policy. Sure, sure. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Wasabi Wallet. With Wasabi Wallet, you can receive, send, and store Bitcoin privately. In Wasabi Wallet, your transaction history and wallet balance are completely hidden. Wasabi Wallet is easy to use, all of its privacy features are built in by default, and it works with any amount of Bitcoin. Wasabi users can make CoinJoin transactions together with BTC Pay server users or Trezor Suite users. For BTC Pay server users, they can make payments directly inside of a CoinJoin, and for Trezor Suite users, you can make CoinJoins directly on a hardware wallet. These features result in the fee savings and security improvements for both sets of users. So go to wasabiwallet.io today to download the state-of-the-art Bitcoin privacy wallet. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Casa. Casa makes it simple to buy and secure your Bitcoin without wondering whether you're doing it right. Specifically, Casa provides a multi-key custody solution, which is by far the most secure way to custody your Bitcoin. Now, when I talk about Bitcoin being theft-proof money or inviolable private property, a multi-key custody model is exactly what I am talking about. 
Using multiple keys lets you maintain full control of your Bitcoin while also giving you redundancy in case you lose one of the keys. It's also the best way to secure your Bitcoin for inheritance planning purposes. So go to keys.casa, that's C-A-S-A, -A, today to sign up and use discount code BREEDLOVE. Have you thought about, um, just because it sounds like this might be a good match with Bitcoin mining, where some of these areas that may have had stranded or unused or underused energy assets, might you might actually be able to perform some Bitcoin mining there yeah. and establish an economic footprint around which you could build a city. Yeah. Um, has there been any discussion about that, like the, the marriage of a free private city with Bitcoin mining? Mm. So it's definitely an idea that we're interested in. Mm -hmm. um, another one of the speakers at uh, our conference was Elena Vranova, mm -hmm. who's doing something similar to that in Paraguay. Um, it's not so much a, you know, free city in the sense that it has like legal autonomy, but she has a Bitcoin mining uh, 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 set up there. And there is, as I understand it, some a kind of community developing around it. Yeah. So there is some activity like relating Bitcoin mining to, to free cities, but it's not kind of at the forefront of what, what's possible. Gotcha. Um, it might be something that would be quite interesting in El Salvador. Mm -hmm. um, we were... Our team were fortunate to be in El Salvador when the announcement of Bitcoin City was was made. I think that was in uh, 2021 mm -hmm. um, and um, or 2022. Um, so so yeah, we were we were like on the ground there, and we watched that very closely. The idea the idea for Bitcoin City is that you're going to have this kind of international metropolis, which has a kind of very low tax system basically they're going to fund most services using just vat as the, yeah. the idea they announced yeah. and that would also be based on around some mining that they would have around the conchawa volcano mm. that, that exists in the region that they've chosen so yeah. that's another thing that like maybe in the future there'll be scope to turn that into something like a more free market governance model like right. like we advocate that's interesting are there um are there restrictions on these cities in terms of like arming themselves? Because I feel like one thing that a government would really be afraid of is that you you empower one of these autonomous zones and all of a sudden they become like an independent state, right? They want to carve themselves off and secede and become their own concern. Yeah. Are, are there restrictions put upon these autonomous zones to try and like make sure they stay part of uh, whatever state they're they're inhabiting so the states are typically established with some kind of treaty with with the government mm -hmm. and that's it doesn't allow for you know succession and, mm -hmm. and things like Correct. that um yeah, as far as I'm aware, there's not any specific clause that says you can't succeed. I think that's just tacitly mm -hmm. the case, unless it says there's specific like provisions mm -hmm. for you to succeed. Mm -hmm. It's tacitly accepted that you don't have the power to do so. Okay, sir. But you know, if if I were a government, it would be something that you know I might think about because according to um, you know you, various UN conventions, um, you are allowed to to which most countries are signatories. Uh, you're allowed the right of self-determination. So mm. if there's a certain group of people that want to be separate from arrest the rest of the country and they occupy um, a dominant place within that population, then they can decide to to succeed. Mm. So that's something that would technically be possible, but it's not something we we really um, you know focus on or seek to create mm -hmm. because we think that, that the most important things you can get um, can come through this this private city model, like mm. you know the defense and foreign policy. That might be something that's beneficial to have, you know, in certain ways. Um, I'd argue that that's probably been quite effective in cases like you know Singapore, mm -hmm. where they are completely autonomous city states. They have their own military, and because of their economic power, they've got a, a very strong military. Mm -hmm. You know, more tanks than Malaysia, for example, which yeah. is twenty times the size. Right. Um, so yeah, there is scope to do. To do foreign policy and stuff as a small entity, but it's not something that we we really push for because we think you can create a kind of win win situation with a host government. Got it. And then the you mentioned too that 
socialist regime has come in to Honduras and that's been challenging. What were the, the, the legal structures that were put in place to protect this free economic zone or free city from encroachment by regime change? So like what, what specifically is it that's protecting, uh, I guess it's, it's Prospera in this case yep. from the new socialist regime in Honduras. So there's essentially two legal mechanisms. The first one is a constitutional protection. Mm -hmm. So in order to make a change to the constitution in Honduras, you have to have a two thirds majority in, in parliament. So it's mm -hmm. not a case of the government changes and then suddenly any law can mm -hmm. be rewritten. You have to secure agreement from more than two thirds of the population. Mm -hmm. So that's added um, some level of, of difficulty to changing the status of, mm -hmm. of the zones. The second thing, and probably the more important thing is international treaties. So there are two international treaties. One of them is a treaty that was signed between Kuwait and Honduras, and another one is called the CAFTA DR Free Trade Agreement. And the important thing about the second one is that the US is a signatory to it. Mm. So that means that if any investor from the US um, has invested in Honduras under with certain guarantees in place, then if those guarantees are changed, the investors have to be compensated. Mm. And if this is challenged in you know, international courts, then there can be very serious repercussions for, uh, for the country in question. Mm. So today, even though Honduras has had quite a turbulent political past, it's never failed to pay compensation when it's been deemed necessary by an international court. Mm. And in, in the case of these zones, there is potentially very, very high liability for the Honduran government if mm. they um, decide not to, uh, if they decide not to uh, comply with the rulings of an international court. Mm. Um, the Prosper is actually suing uh, the Honduran government at the moment for about $10 billion, which is a sizable part of Honduras's GDP. So uh, we'll see, hopefully, everyone right. on our side hopes that that will just get resolved rather yeah. than that going yeah. that having to actually take effect in the courts and that they'll come to some sort of agreement to allow the zones to continue right um but there are basically two two ways yeah international treaties that do have quite significant yeah. teeth and there are a couple of those in place and then there's also this constitutional protection what is that if i can pry about the 10 billion dollar like what is that about that's, this is the idea that there are those investors that have put in that $60 million uh, with the expectation of getting returns. Yeah. And all of the damages for the people that have uh, worked in the zone and, uh, you know, spent their time time and, and resources uh, putting that, uh, putting putting it into, into the zone on the expectation that the regime will be continued. Yeah. And they've calculated what the potential economic losses of that could be. Mm. And uh, this is the, the claim that they're taking to, the, to an international court in order to... Um, try and convince the Tongjiren government to change its path. But how did, so, oh, so this, they're saying that the return on the 60 million would be 10 billion? So yeah. They're suing for, oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So something like that. I'm not, I'm not sure yeah. all of the details of it, yeah. but it's like the estimated, if you compare what is projected right. to be produced by these, these zones within yeah. the, the period, yeah. which is a 50 year, 50 year period where the the special status of, right. of Prospera is is in place, then yeah, they projected the damages and told to be worth about ten billion. Right. So that's the figure they've taken to these. Wow. Okay. Well, it's yeah. a pretty pretty big stick. Yeah. Um, sure. Yeah. What? Okay. So if the if you guys succeed beyond your wildest imagination and fully realize the vision for free of free cities in the world, let's say, what? does that look like and what does the world look like as a result mm. so the world i would like to see is a world where there are many more independent jurisdictions where people are much closer to their governing entity and as a result we live in a much more peaceful and harmonious world mm. some people might view that as a bit paradoxical uh, particularly because there's a lot of narrative around, you know, particularly that organizations like the European Union mm -hmm. would say, oh, it's good to be cooperating and harmonious, um, so we need to centralize power in one single entity. Mm -hmm. Whereas actually, I think the solution is the opposite. If we create lots of small territories, 
then they have much more of an incentive to peacefully right. cooperate with each other. Because right. if they decide they can wall themselves off from the world and isolate themselves, they lose all the benefits of free trade and right. economies of scale. So if we had lots of these zones freely cooperating, we'd probably have uh, fewer wars mm -hmm. because you don't have these strong leaders that can marshal the resources of hundreds of mm -hmm. millions of people to their particular political mm -hmm. goals. The individual people that are part of the city have to be so supportive of the military campaign that they're willing to directly pay for it through their through their fees. I think that's a much more unlikely thing to happen mm -hmm. if you have more smaller entities. So I think the world that I want to create would look something like this. You'd have you know, thousands of individual political entities but there was lots of capacity and agreements for people to move freely between them. Like you mm -hmm. can easily have an agreement that says if you're a member of this city and this city and this city, like you can move freely between. Right, between right, right. Um, and I think that's also going to be a world where there's a much uh, less waste. Like we have much leaner governments because there's competition between the governments. Mm -hmm. The governments are serving people better in terms of you know things like security and infrastructure because they have a profit and loss motive Ugh. and um yeah i mean now that we have bitcoin as well i think there's there's a good chance that this could come to serve as a global medium uh, of exchange because the advantage that bitcoin has as opposed to the us dollar is that it doesn't have this central authority that can censor transactions Ugh. pass inflation onto the rest of the world we now have a genuinely politically neutral money and so i think in the future if bitcoin continues to develop the way in it has been, then we could well see this serve as a, a global form of money that allows this vision to become possible in terms of trade. Wow. Yeah, it's it's exciting. Uh, it reminds me of the sovereign individual thesis a lot. Yeah. Well, the book talks about us moving from a world of like 200 nation states to one of 20,000 independent city states. And um, yeah, it's exciting to see some real experimentation being carried out on that front. Yeah. Yeah, I think the thesis of the sovereign individual is fundamentally one I agree with. Mm -hmm. The idea that we're becoming more and more mobile mm -hmm. in the age of the internet. Yeah. The fact that it used to be the case that people were very coupled to their place of work. Mm -hmm. I think in the sovereign individual they talk about how the industrial revolution brought everyone together in factory towns mm -hmm. and so you had these big centers of political power yeah. around physical places of work. But now that's that's changing. Yeah, like lots of us work purely in the digital economy. Mm -hmm. Like I do now. I haven't been tied to a particular location since about 2020 mm -hmm. um, because all of my work has been done online. Mm -hmm. So there are more and more people that are going in that direction, and that gives us more leverage to kind of pick and choose our jurisdictions. Right. And as we have more choice to move our capita. Yeah. And move talent to new places i think we're going to see governments become more responsive yeah. and more of the governance models that i've described today are going to become uh viable from a business perspective well. yeah no it makes all the sense in the world like the more options individuals have the less power governments have really and so you the, the governance model will need to adapt to the new technological paradigm that we're in yeah so i think will happen yeah very exciting um, okay, good sir, Peter. I've kept you long enough. Um, where can people find you on the internet? So we are active on Twitter. Our Twitter handle is Free Cities Found. Okay. Uh, our website is free cities.org. Okay. And then our conference website is uh, libertyinourlifetime.org. Okay. And that's the place. If you w people want to find out about the idea of free cities, then that's the place once a year where representatives of all the projects come together and kind of showcase what they're doing. Awesome. And that's in Prague in what month? The that's conference? coming up in Prague in October. In October? Yeah, 14th okay. and 15th. Of okay, cool. October. How big is that event? Do you know? So we, we expect to about 400 people there in person. Okay. And there's also options for online attendees as well. Awesome. Okay. Well, I do love Prague, so maybe I'll come back. <laughs> oh, we'd love to have you, Robert, yeah. if you uh, want to come along. All right. Uh, thank you so much for doing this, and uh, I guess we should go to the conference. Yeah, yeah sounds good. All right. All right. Great to chat. Thanks, Peter.